Hello everyone and welcome to Slide of Arm Demystifying Intel Houdini. Uh, my name is Brian and I'll be discussing Intel's Houdini Binary Translator. So what it is, where it's used, how it works, security concerns, and recommendations. Uh, but before that, a little bit about myself real quick. Um, that's me, I'm Brian Hong. I studied electrical engineering at the Cooper Union and I'm currently working as a security consultant with the NCC group. Where lately I've been performing a lot of Android pen tests and sometimes even Android malware analysis. Um, besides that, I like to build random bits of hardware and also like to reverse engineer uh, low-level stuff that other people build, both software and hardware. So with that, let's get started with Android. So Android is one of the largest operating systems in the world. Um, and you can write an applications for Android, Android applications using Java and Kotlin. And you could also, um, as well as C and C++ using their native development kit. Android was originally designed and built for ARM devices, but Google later added support for x86. And just to note, there has been uh, out of tree support before that as well, um, such as the Android x86 project. So since then, there's been several Android devices running on x86, but now there's mainly two, which are x86 Chromebooks and x86 hosts running commercial Android emulators. However, apps generally lack support for x86 still, and that's because ARM is, prim ARM is the primary hardware platform for Android. And in fact, if you have native components in your app, the Play Store only requires the ARM builds. And because of this, many native applications don't end up containing any x86 binaries, only ARM. So how can x86 devices running Android run these apps that only contain ARM binaries? And this would be a great time for me to introduce you to Houdini. So Houdini, the topic of this talk, is Intel's proprietary binary translator that allows x86 devices to run ARM binaries. And it was co-created with Google as it was designed to be run with Android native bridge. We'll get to that in a second. Um, Houdini is this mysterious little black box. We don't know what it, uh, we don't know how it does. We don't know how it works, and there doesn't seem to be any documentation on it. Um, and it's possible some vendor vendors may be trying to hide that they're using it. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that as well. And there are three variants, 32-bit uh, x86, uh, implementing 32-bit ARM, 64x86, 32-bit ARM, 64-bit x86, 64-bit ARM. Right. So Houdini can be used in physical hardware as they were on x86 based mobile phones and they are still used in x86 uh, Chromebooks uh, which is how we actually got the binaries so we could take a look at them. Um, they're also used in some commercial Android emulators such as BlueStacks and Knox. While I don't believe they're enabled by default, I, I think, I believe, I remember, I think there is an option to enable it in the settings. And also it's used in the Android x86 project. Um, which can be run on a real hardware or on an emulator. Okay, so how does it work? Houdini is basically a interpreted emulator for ARM instructions. Um, what that means is there's a loop reading ARM instructions, the opcodes, and it produces a corresponding behavior in x86. I just want to make clear that it does not do just-in-time compilation. Um, it doesn't translate nor output any x86 instruction. It reads it and then does the behavior. Um, and Houdini has two main components. Uh, the first, just Houdini, runs executables, and the second, libHoudini, is used to load and link ARM shared objects. So like I said, the first part, Houdini, runs ARM executables, uh, both statically and dynamically linked. Uh, when running dynamic, binaries, it actually uses its own set of pre-compiled libraries for ARM Android, um, in addition to the x86 library uh, needed by the rest of the Android and Houdini itself. And there's a screenshot from the Chromebook actually. Uh, you can see that we have a x86 machine denoted by i686 at the end. And the program I'm trying to run, Hello Static, is a 32-bit ARM statically linked ELF binary. And I run it, dot slash hello static, and it just prints hello world. Um, so 
Some of you may have noticed that I just executed the binary directly without invoking Houdini. So you might be wondering where does Houdini come in from. Um, and this is actually a, a kind of cool feature, a uh, Linux kernel feature called bin format misc. And if you are familiar with it, here's a, I'll give you a quick explanation. Uh, miscellaneous binary format is a Linux kernel feature that lets you basically register uh, interpreters for custom binary formats. Kind of similar how a shebang works for in, in, in Bash or Python programs. Um, so in our specific case, our custom binary format is I is a arm elf binary. So the two screenshots below show the registered entries for uh, static and dynamic uh, arm elf binaries. And you can see that the interpreter is set to a system bin Houdini. So essentially the 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 resulting effect is when I try to when I type in dot slash hello in bash or try to exec this binary, the kernel compares the magic bytes by looking at the first n bytes. If it matches, it turns it into that. Um, so it, it actually execs system bin Houdini and it passes my program name as the first argument. Um, right. So now that we know how the, the Houdini part is being used, let's look at the more interesting second component, which is libhoudini.so. Uh, libhoudini is itself a shared object for x86, and it's used to load other shared object for ARM. That's built for ARM. It was designed to be used with Android Native Bridge, so let's 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 talk about that. So Android Native Bridge is the component in Android that allows this binary translation to work. Um, it is part of the Android runtime and is the main interface between our Android side and our Houdini binary. Um, <coughs> so Native Bridge provides an interface for for our Android to talk with Houdini and the. I want to point out that while it might have been designed specifically with ARM and Houdini in mind, the interface that it provides can be used to implement other processor architectures. For example, running MIPS on MIPS code on an ARM device. So <coughs> it's part of Android runtime. So it's initialized on boot. And when it during it, it checks that system property, RO Delvic VM native bridge, and if it's set to zero, it's disabled. If it's not, the value is used as the name of the library to load, which implements the native bridge implementation. So in our case, that would be libhoudini.so. Actually, a few interesting things about this. Um, according to DevCon talk a few years back, it seems like BlueStacks renamed libhoudini to something like lib3btrans.so for or something for some unknown reasons um, and also looks like uh, Android x86 Android project uses their own implementation libmb.so but when you take a look at the source tree it it's actually just a thin wrapper that loads and uses libhoudini itself um, another interesting thing was um, there there's a script in the Android x86 project um, that enables native bridge and it, it downloads uh, Libudini from a couple of obfuscated .cn URL shorteners. And yeah, it also seems like they moved that link and the correspond related code around a couple of times. Not sure what's going on there, but back on topic, uh, Native Bridge defines two main callback interfaces. And just to get off topic again, I have to talk about the JNI first before I get into those callbacks. So Java native interface is a foreign function interface that enables our JVM code to interact with the native code and vice versa. And yeah, so this part is actually not specific to Android and it is part of Java. So on the right side, we see our, we see a struct, the JNI native interface. The, and it's it's also typed up to, to, uh, its pointer is also typed up to JNIF. Uh, so this struct is basically a bag of function pointers that's provided to the native code so that our native code could be, could use these functions to perform low level JVM reflection. And um, I cut out a lot of it. There's a lot of functions functions in there, but some of them are, you know, calling, uh, calling methods, getting the method ID, allocating object, getting a field, 
um, finding classes, and so on. So this, the pointer to this struct is actually passed as the first argument um, when a Java, when your Java code calls the native code. Uh, and we'll see how that's used later. So the first uh, callback interface from native bridge is the native bridge runtime callbacks. Um, it, it's quite simple, but it, it's passed from native bridge to our libhoudini binary so that our libhoudini uh, can call, find and call native functions in the Android side or the native bridge side. The second more interesting callback interface is the native bridge callbacks. And this is quite kind of like the opposite. It provides a way for our native bridge to call functions in our libhoudini binary. Um, we, we see some of the functions on the right. Uh, the most interesting of these are initialize, load library, and get trampoline. The, the latter two of which are quite similar to how DL open and DL sim works. And I'll show that in a later slide. Um, yeah, so this this struct is actually um, exposed via the symbol native bridge ITF, which can be seen here. Um, by looking at it in, in a hex editor or disassembler, you can see all the um, function pointers uh, in that data structure. So I have all of the components of like native bridge explained kind of. So I'm going to try my best to kind of put them all together. So here we go. So normally it would look something like this. Here you have an ARM device running ARM Android and we want to load a ARM native library. So when your application launches, it would call system.load library and which would trigger the Android runtime to run call DL open and that will load our libnative.so into memory, into the process. And then when our app wants to call a native code, native function, it will first do a DLSIM, which will return a function pointer to our code. And then it jumps to it with the first argument being the pointer to our JNIM structure. And if our native code wants to interact with the Java world, it could do so by looking for the appropriate function in the JNIM you know, function pointers. Now, this gets a little more complicated when we talk about native words. So before anything happens, um, native bridge gets loaded on boot, right? So it checks that system property and sees that it's pointing to libhoudini.so. And it, it, it DL opens our libhoudini library. So, and note, it the, our Android and our device is x86, and so is libhoudini. And our goal is to run code, which is an ARM in our libnative.so. So after that, uh, after libhoudini is loaded, it fetches the native bridge callbacks using dlsim and calls initialize, which isn't um, shown in the diagram. So after that, you know, the Android continues to boot up. And then when you launch your app, it would try to load the library again with system.load or load library, which triggers native bridge plus Android runtime to call our um, native, bridge, native bridge callbacks load library, um, which acts similar to a deal open. So it will return a handle. And with that handle, we could pass it to get trampoline to get a function uh, pointer, similar to a DL sim. Now we can't, we can't actually just use DL open and DL sim directly because the kernel will complain it's a different architecture. And especially for DL sim, because DL sim will give you a function pointer. So Houdini has their own versions, load library and get trampoline. Um, load library just opens our native file and maps it into memory. And get trampoline should return the function pointer, but it doesn't, um, it can't return the actual function pointer to our native library because our code is written in ARM or it will contain ARM instructions in there, which our x86 processor probably won't know how to handle. So instead, libhoudini returns a, a pointer to a little step inside of our interpreter, inside our libhoudini, so that when we call the, the function returned by get trampoline, the interpreter is going to start running, and the interpreter will in turn start reading the native code and executing it. So the last part um, I have to I want to bring up is the 
JNIV env pointer. I mentioned the that the when when the, the your Java code calls native code, the pointer to JNI env is passed as the first argument. Uh, we can't pass that straight to straight through to our native code because um, well our native code is running in ARM and our JNI functions are in x86. So what the Houdini does is it just remembers where it's it's like where it is and then it creates its own fake version um, that's filled with ARM instructions. Actually it's filled um, the JNI and function pointers point to a bunch of uh, trap instructions. That way when the interpreter sees those ARM trap instructions it knows which of like proper JNI uh, function to call on the real x86 structure. All right, so now that I've kind of explained how Libredini comes together with Native Bridge and how it all fits together, let's start digging deeper into how the interpreter part works. And starting with memory. So the emulation is a dual architecture. So it contains both uh, and separate ARM and x86 binaries. And it is a shared virtual address space as well as they both have real world view of memory. So what that means is the x86 parts of the process and the ARM parts of the process view the memory the same way and they're in the same they're in the same address space so there's no magic translation between an ARM address versus an x86 address and the last point is um, there is a separate allocation for ARM stack and just to just to show um, this is a snippet from one of the apps process memory memory map. Um, we see here our native libraries loaded up there and on down there we have our Lipudini loaded. Um, we could also see a bunch of uh, ARM uh, libraries loaded that's used by our native code. Um, the next one is yeah um, specifically libc and a couple of others we could see that are loaded for both ARM and x86. And we also see a bunch of anonymously mapped pages, which is used internally by Lipudini. And our our um, our ARM stack lives somewhere in, er, in around there. So moving on, I want to talk about the actual execution loop. So I mentioned earlier, it's essentially a switch statement inside a while loop. Um, so this screenshot shows the portion of the interpreter where it would like it would fetch it would do it would read the instruction it would partially decode it and then jump to the proper instruction handler um, so I ha in this assembly I have the comments on the right but I do have a equivalent C code on the next slide so basically I I'm gonna run through this real quick the snippet of code um, gets the um, program counter from the processor state reads the instruction from memory and then checks the condition bit, condition field, condition code? Yeah, condition code to determine whether the current instruction should be executed or not. Once it determines that it should, um, it calculates this offset by concatenating bits 20 to 27 and the bits 4 to 7. So that offset is used as the entry offset into this instruction handler table, which is filled with a bunch of function pointers to instruction handlers. Um, and then it jumps to it. So, for example, our move r0 r1 instruction has the um, entry offset of 0x181, and each entry is a 32 bit address. So, multiplied by 4 bytes, we get 0x684. And then, so the final offset, final address that this function pointer is in is 4bc044. And we could see that right here. Yeah, if I look at it through a, um, a disassembler, in at that address we see a pointer to our function handler, instruction move one, and um, just note that the, this decompilation is not entirely correct. But already we could see in around lines 22, 23, and what about 27, we see some registers being moved around, um, and even some uh, shifting and masking because move uh, instruction has the option to do that. Um, the important thing to look at is that the 
All of the instruction handlers have two parameters that's passed in. The first is the instruction itself, the instruction bytes, so that the handler can instruct the instruction handler could pull out the operand and fully decode it. And the second argument is the processor state. And it is basically what it is. It's, it's this data structure that keeps track of the ARM emulated ARM's processor state. It mostly contains the register values, um, such as you know R0, R1, but also registers such as the program counter, stack pointer, link register, and so on. Uh, it also contains uh, a byte that tells you whether it's in thumb mode or not. And there's a bunch of other fields, but I couldn't really figure out what all of those do. Um, note that this is just a data structure in a uh, in memory, and they have shared memory address addresses between the x86 and the ARM side. So you can technically just, if you find it, you could write values to these registers, uh, to this struct to change the register values inside of ARM. So the next thing I took a look at was the syscalls. Uh, trying to figure out, figure out how syscalls worked. Syscalls are just instructions as well. They're special instructions, but they are instructions. So we could actually find them in the instruction handler table. Um, you can see on the right, it takes the same parameters, the instruction and the processor state. Uh, this is also in, not entirely correct, the decompilation. But we, we could see that it, there, it actually doesn't issue any x86 syscalls. But rather, it just sets that SVC number field in the processor state and returns. So the, the actual um, switch for um, issuing x86 syscalls is further down that, that loop in the interpreter. And depending on which uh, uh, syscall number it is, it will do different things. Most of the time, it's just simple wrappers or pass-throughs with some conversion between like moving the ARM register value to the actual x86 register and calling int80 in x86, or just simple you know conversions. But some of them are a little more complicated complicated than the other. One such example that was interest of to us was the clone syscall. And I've actually combined fork and clone here because nowadays if you call fork will go to libc fork, which will actually call clone. So clone was also very interesting because it has a parameter there to pass in called child stack. And you pass in a memory region, which will be used as a child stack. And on top of that set stack will be the return address so that when the child is cloned, it will return and that address becomes the entry point of our child process. Now we were wondering how that gets handled by Lipudini, and it turns out the child stack we pass in is not passed to the kernel, but instead Lipudini creates its own empty RWX page and passes that as the child stack and handles the parent and child logic. So now that we have some ideas on how it works internally, let, let's get to the fun stuff. So, detection. Um, is there ways we could detect whether we're running, as an app, we're running inside of Lipidini or not? Uh, we came up with a couple of ways, and the first way would be uh, we build an ARM native app, and in that app, we could check the host architecture, either via Java's OS Arch system property or by reading the proc CPU info. Um, but as it turns out, you actually can't do that because Houdini hides these. Uh, so when you do OSR system get dot get property, the Houdini uh, makes it say rmv 7 l um, from the Java side when you're running with native bridge, and um, when you try to cat proc CPU in, CPU info, um, it would actually return rmv 8 processor revision one AR64. Um, Actually, if, you, if you're careful, you might be able to tell whether you're running under Houdini because there there seems to be some inconsistency because one of them will return on v7, the other one will return on v8, and hardware says placeholder, funny enough. Um, so there are some other ways as well. So checking the memory map. Um, you could 
try to read the memory maps and see if either Lipudini is loaded or both ARM and our x86 libraries are loaded. Um, so these are these are okay methods, but we think the best ways are those that are in undetectable itself. So like no syscalls issues, no files being open, and anything that would trigger a um, analysis tool, um, you know. So the method I came up with was using the JNIF, JNIM function pointer. So I mentioned earlier, if you're on a real device, well, I, I mentioned earlier that Lipudini creates uh, its own ARM version of the JNIF env structure function pointers. Now, if you're on a real device, uh, those function pointers will point to real ARM opcodes. But if you're running under Lipudini, the function pointers will point to also real uh, ARM instructions, but those would be syscall instructions. I'll have a quick demonstration of that later. So the next thing is, once we detect that we're running inside a, a libhoudini, can we escape to x86 with it? So of course we could call mprotect and write code to memory. Um, but again, this isn't very subtle. We, we would need to call mprotect, which would probably trigger most of the analysis tools. Um, and another way we could try to do this is by x86 stack manipulations. We know approximately where the x86 stack, stack is, so we could try to clobber the stack with raw payloads and have it jump to somewhere. And one of this this method is much more annoying, but one of the harder parts is trying to figure out where we could actually run our code. So we would need to find a page that has execute permissions or try to find a bunch of a lot of raw payloads. Um, that brings us to security concerns. Um, <laughs> turns out Lipudini uses, uh, creates a bunch of RWX pages. Um, they use internally, and we see we saw one of these for that, which is being used for the clone syscall. Um, and they have read, write, and execute permissions, which means we could write x86 code to them and just jump to it. Um, and they're, they're again shared memory, so we could write code from either both x86 side or from the ARM side. Um, so just to show you what some of these are used for, um, the ARM JNIM, the ones filled with uh, trap instructions, is in there. Uh, the ARM stack is in that memory region. So back to security constraints. Uh, we have RWX pages in x86, so what about trying to get code execution on ARM? So it turns out Houdini ignores this bit entirely. Um, yeah, which just means you could you could load, you could write code anywhere and jump to it. And I don't think I need to explain why that's a issue. Um, but yeah, ARM libraries themselves are loaded without the execute bit on their pages. Um, so regarding the ignore, uh, regarding the behavior ignoring the non-execute bit. Not that this is correct, but if you think about it, this kind of makes sense. Houdini is an interpreter for ARM. The, the interpreter gets the data input. And if that means if you could read the data, read the instructions, uh, it will run it. So to demonstrate that, I got this little program here, nxstack.c. And in my main, I allocate some memory on the stack. Uh, code five twelve, and then I write two ARM instructions on it, and then I make that and cast that into function pointers and jump to it. And normally, on a real device, real ARM device, this would cause a sec fault. But as we see below, it doesn't. It it just works. And actually, in the first iteration of this um, code, I accidentally had the memory outside of the function. So it was on the, in the data section or some other region, and it still worked perfectly fine. Um, well, th this w they worked. This runs fine with devices running with Lipudini. So the next up is uh, a couple of quick demos. Um, so f for the demo, I r this is th this is on the Chromebook, and for the demo, I wrote this app, and I've actually built it. To build two separate separate versions of it. It's the exact same source. I just have two versions of it. One is built with just x86 libraries, our native code, 
and one only contains the ARM um, binary. So the top one is the x86 one, and the bottom one is the ARM. And the Chromebook itself is x86. So to run the bottom app, it is running through Libhoudini. So the first tab is CPU info. Well, you know, overturn the values that I mentioned before. And the top one doesn't have any Libhoudini. It's running x86 on x86. So all the values are correct. We see genuine Intel. Everything is all nice. Whereas on the bottom, we're running it with um, Libhoudini. And we saw the output we saw before, v 7 v 8 inconsistency as well as hardware equals placeholder. The second tab demonstrates the get version, the detection method I quickly described. But here we see on the x86, uh, when we dereference the get version and call static int method functions, I believe, I mean, those are valid x86 instructions. Um, I just, I think those are a bunch of push instructions as you've often see in the beginning of a function. And on the bottom, when we do the same thing, fetch all. Um, so this is running with Lipudini, so we will see ARM instruction. But specifically, those those uh, instructions, 0xEF000, those are our syscall instructions. Um, so we could pr you could use that as a method to detect whether Lipudini is running or not. Um, in this case, the so the third tab actually is not for demonstration, just the utility to show you the process's memory map. So in x86, there's no Libudini and there should everything should look fine, right? Um, but when we look at the the uh, the ARM version's process map, uh, we see a bunch of anonymous map memory. We see Libudini right there. And we should also see our ARM libraries loaded uh, in right there. Okay, so the I think the more most interesting tab is the last tab, the exec, which demonstrates the NX bit um, or the lack of NX bit check on the ARM side with Lipudini. So top one is running without Lipudini, um, and just to kind of explain you what this layout layout is. So on the left side, you will write some bytes. That's gonna get written to a buffer. Uh, you're gonna type in some bytes, and then you're gonna click run, and then it will be passed to a native code where those bytes will be actually written to memory, and then jump to. However, the top top one is our x86 version, so obviously we can't run um, ARM instructions, and there's no Libhoudini loaded. So it's gonna crash. That was the intended behavior. However, on apps that's running with Lipudini, we could actually just type in valid ARM instructions, click run, and it would run. And I have a, I have a couple of different uh, programs written up there because I don't want to type it out manually. Um, run, and then multiply, multiply is R1 and R2, and then adds it to R0. Uh, and that's correct, and get SP. Um, actually reads the stack pointer of the ARM processor and returns it. Um, and just to show you that this is dynamic, these bytes are actually being copied. I could change the actual bytes of the instruction. Um, reading the 15, register 15 will be reading the PC. Um, I could also modify, like, so the left side is completely changeable. Um, as long as it's executable um, ARM instructions, it will run it. I change the one to a two or a three, and would add three. Same thing for um, adding two integers. I add it three times, so two times three plus six is thirteen. So just for completeness, um, I have the same app, but now it's running on a real ARM device. So this this device happened to be ARM V8. So we'll say ARM V8 and AR64 processor. Um, it's it's gonna all look correct. There's no Lipudini l running on this because it's an ARM device running ARM code. Um, so we go to the detect tab. Uh, skip to it. We go to detect tab. We see just valid ARM instructions that are not um 
that are not syscalls. And in the maps, um, you know, this should also be fine, completely fine. Um, no Houdini, no, um, yeah. And of course, this is not running with Lib Houdini. This is just running on actual ARM hardware. So when we try to copy these bytes into malloc memory or stack with a heap, and then jump to it, it would crash. And it does. With demos out of the way, let's now talk about possibilities of malware that knows about Lipidini. To start, we know that applications are often run in sandbox environments for analysis. This is mainly done in one of three ways. Um, running on them on actual devices would give the most realistic behaviors, but it is hard to do on a large scale and also hard to instrument. Um, the second best option is fully virtualized environments like Kenmu, um, but these have somewhat a uh, a performance overhead since they would have to emulate the entire hardware and the processor. And that brings us to our third option, uh, Android emulators. And um, those uh, Android emulators on x86 devices um, can use technology like Houdini to run ARM application. This has the least overhead as it would only emulate parts of the application instead of the whole um, hardware and the operating system. And on another point, um, most of you would agree that inconsistent behaviors are harder to debug. And similarly, apps that may or may not have behaved maliciously are harder to detect and are also harder to analyze. So let's combine those points. And so for example, a malware can use one of those detection methods mentioned previously to figure out whether or not it is running with Lipudini then it's possible for the malware to act benevolently when it thinks it is under analysis by seeing that Lipudini is being used. And in other cases, it show, show malicious behaviors when Lipudini is not present. Um, yeah. So what about the other way around? We could also perform malicious actions on only when Houdini is present abusing the knowledge of its inner workings to further obfuscate itself. And for example, we don't know what the Play Store uses nowadays, but it seems like their um, automatic app testing doesn't use, uh, doesn't run ARM AP APKs on x86 with the Houdini. In a, in, a, in a case like this, um, a malware could detect that it's running um, on, well, it's not being, on, not under analysis, and when it is running on their Lipudini, for example, Lipudini, for example, inside a, a commercial emulator, then it could do some tricks like running code from the stack, which you can't do on a real device. And trying to analyze that would prove to be difficult because uh, a static analysis tool would see that um, you write some code onto the stack and it jumps to it, and that should crash. Whereas if you're running on their Lipudini, it works. So we finally come to the recommendations and how not to write an emulator. And we can start by talking about the RWX pages. Um, so we, we noticed that Libudini internally uses, uh, well, Libudini maps a bunch of page, RWX pages to be used internally. And those should not be there. Um, if it's really necessary, we recommend performing a finer grain uh, page permission control. Now, one of those methods would be implementing an efficient NX implementation. So uh, we see that we understand that checking page permissions every instruction would incur a very significant overhead, right? right. Every, every instruction you want to run, it has to check the page permissions via software. So instead, what we could do is we keep track of it in a data structure and we only check if the instruction we're currently running is different than the previous instructions. So in the case of jumps or um, instructions across a page boundary, we could check those. Um, so this basically becomes our user land page table implementation. Given that um, our recommendation, like our recommendation is to just use virtualization. Simple enough. But regarding actually implementing the user line page table via software, 
uh, we could do it in a couple of ways, right? Um, we could only trust the text section of the library on load. And the other option is to check the memory map and every time a new page is added. And then if a new page is added, we add that to our data structure that we keep track of. And third, we could, um, we could hook uh, the memory mapping related syscalls and then add whenever, for example, mmap is ma uh, called or mprotect is called with the execute permissions, we update our data structure accordingly. So ideal solution combines the last two, the two and three. So it will, um, yeah, every time you do an mmap or mprotect, for example, it would add an entry into our um, data structure that keeps track of the page permissions. And just as a catch-all, we could check the memory map for new pages that's not already in there. And this has some good side effects, such as um, we can now, since we have a user, uh, user line page table, we could do dynamic um, library loading via DL open. And we could also do legitimate just-in-time compilation. And of course, the used uh, JIT pages should be cleared, um, properly cleaned up after usage to prevent page reuse attacks. And another thing is that, of course, this data structure is a critical data structure as it acts as our page table and should be heavily protected. So some of the things we mentioned is writable only when being updated, surrounded by guard pages, not accessible to ARM, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And another thing we recommend for um, researchers or vendors doing analysis of Android applications is when you're running dynamic analysis, you should also run apps through libpudini. As we mentioned, it's possible for malwares or any other applications to behave differently when they see that libpudini is enabled. Also, when doing static analysis, we should look for access to Houdini RWX pages or attempts to execute from non-executable pages, um, which would work if it was running under Um And to, just to add on that, uh, anything scanning for JNIV M function pointers, as that was one of our detection methods. So to summarize, summarize what I'm trying to say in this presentation is that Houdini introduces a couple of security weaknesses into processes using it. And that would be ARM native applications running on x86 devices. Um, some of these impact the security of the emulator ARM code, such as the NX bit, um, the lack of NX bit check, while some also impact the security of the host x86 code, such as the rewrite execute pages everywhere. Um, yeah. And I actually think. Um, the fact that Houdini is not well documented publicly nor easily accessible has something to do with preventing wider security analysis and research into this, uh, which could have caught these issues earlier. Um, yeah, which brings us to our few last slides. Um, I'd like to give big, big, big special thanks to Jeff for mentoring this project and helping develop the methodology. Um, also, Jennifer for all the support and research and amazing feedbacks and Effie for basically bootstrapping this research. And with that, uh, thanks everyone for joining and I believe we are at Q&A right now.